Revolution Radio. Thank you for coming on, Gary. Um, let me just introduce you. You're a uh, Christian apologist, a public speaker. Um, you're uh, the editor and chief of um, GaryDemar.com. You're also heavily involved with American Vision, author of God and Government, The Reduction of Christianity, Last Day's Madness, and your most recent book, if I'm correct, Wars and Rumors of Wars. Yes, right. Yes. Uh, and you're very prolific. Uh, thank you for your time, because I know you're busy, because I read your articles on, <laughs> Gar on GaryDemar.com. So you are very prolific. It puts me to shame, really, um, the sort of output you. Uh, how many articles do you do in a day? Do you do at least a couple? I, I just, well, I do two a day, and then I share them. Uh, I'm, I'm back on AmericanVision.org. So I, I, I write one on AmericanVision.org, and I write one on um, GaryDemar.com, and then I switch them. Uh, each each day. So I basically do, you know, an article a day, but I'm one ahead. So I switch them on a daily basis. And then I'm working on some other projects. I'm doing a couple of uh, filmings out in uh, Idaho at the end of the month on uh, government and then one on eschatology. So uh, I've, I've been working on that for the last couple of weeks. All right, cool. Um, well, let, let's get stuck into it then, because it, it, everything that you're doing, it, it, I mean, it all, it sort of intersects, doesn't it, the whole issue? I mean, you know, it's not like a, a eschatology and 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 the and the the issue of of Christianity in the in the political and cultural arena. They do, you know, they're intrinsically linked. It's not like the two things are mutually exclusive. Um, and as I said to you on on Facebook last night. It, there's an absence, it seems to me anyway, there's an absent, absence and, and subsequent impotence in the political and cultural arena um, of the church. Um, you know, it's like Christianity has retreated largely, it seems to me, to, to a private worship affair. And, you know, where, whereas, you know, every, every other group seems to lobby so heavily. Um, and Christianity does seem to be absent in that regard. Yeah, if you go back and look at the you know the history of of Christianity and its impact in every area of life, from uh, music, medicine, uh, 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 science, a lot of people think, oh, there's been this tension being between religion and science. Uh, it's it's only been on the uh, the dogmatism of of science, uh, but the, the the you know the greatest scientists in the history of of the world have been Christians. You know, you got Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, and the area of of, of chemistry. Uh, uh, publishing. I mean, the first book that came off of the of Gutenberg's printing press was uh, was a Latin version of of the Bible. Uh, I mean, you just go on down the list, and Christianity was at the forefront of all this. And even universities, in, yeah, the uni Oh, yeah, the university system. I mean, look at great. You know, look at Great Britain. Um, the university system was essentially a a, a Christian uh, uh, application. And this, here in the United States, you have Harvard, and Yale, and Princeton, and Columbia. It's amazing to go back and, and look at the founding of Harvard, and it says to, to lay Christ at the bottom as the only foundation. Um, and then today, these institutions have been taken over by, uh, by secularists. Uh, so in everything that we're, we're seeing happening today in our culture is because there has been a fundamental retreat from a Christian worldview. Yes, and it, it seems to me that there are well-meaning Christians who really do believe and sign on to the idea that you know the, the christianity is it is a private affair we're separate from the word we, we have to be in the word but not of the word and you know this idea that it's it's a spiritual phenomenon we need to sort of keep ourselves away from the word and the word is you know it's passing in a way and uh let's not get too involved and then of course you've got the whole dispensationalist thing i mean if christians were as focused and involved in other areas as they are with Israel and all the end times obsession, the West wouldn't find itself essentially almost on the brink of collapse, it seems to me at times, you know? Oh, I, I think that's true. Uh, I mean, if you look at eschatology here again in the uh, the great missionary movements around the world were were led by, by people who did not believe that the end of the world was going to take place. Uh, they they believe that the the application of the gospel would change lives and change societies. Uh, uh, William Carey is a is a perfect example of of that. Uh, and so the great missionary movements, the great uh, migration of Christians to uh, the Americas, uh, was again was precipitated 
you know, by the belief that the, the gospel was yet was just a stepping stone to a greater manifestation of, of the kingdom. These guys did not believe that the world was going to come to an end and that Jesus was going to rapture his church out at any moment. They never would have done what they did. If, if modern day dispensationalism, which is a 19th century invention, yeah, uh, was you know was in 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 play back then, there wouldn't have been any need to 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 uh, for pilgrims to leave and Puritans to, to to leave, because they would have seen this as the end of the world, and so they you know they were getting essentially the world was getting its just desserts, and as a result uh, there must have been some indication that Jesus was coming back soon. Now there were people who. There, there were these movements of um, eschatological uh, uh, urgency uh, here in the United States. We had the, 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 the Millerites, and so there always have been people who have, who have tried to predict that the end was near based upon current events, and of course they all have one thing in common, they've all been wrong. And it's an unfortunate, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate that, that Christians have such a short memory, number one, and number two, they have no historical perspective. Uh, and since, since I do this for a living and I point these things out to people, in 1970, I was, uh, I was 20 years old in 1970, and the, the bestseller uh, of, the, of the day of any book was Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth. I, I became a Christian in 1973, but that was all the talk. I mean, that book sold 20-some million copies uh, in the 1970s, and that was one book. And the uh, and it, it set the stage for this belief that everything was going to come come uh, to an end uh, before 1988, because they believed that Israel became a nation again in 1948 was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy based upon the fig tree prophecy, and then they they believed that a generation was 40 years based upon Matthew 24:34. You had the 40 to 48, got 1988. The rapture was supposed to take place sometime before 1988. And, you know, here well, we are, what is this? It. They, yeah, I mean, 20, 30, <laughs> almost 40, almost 40 years, uh, you know, since that time. And we're still here. And this has been, Christians have wasted this great opportunity and have given the culture away based upon a misreading of Scripture. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is exegetically, uh, it's, it's terrible. I mean, it's, it's non-existent. I mean, it's the, it's the exegesis of convenience. Well, it is. It's simple. You know, it's simple. Hey, look, I see that the world's a mess. There's a lot I'd have to do in order to make it change, uh, and so I'm going to I'm going to believe the most convenient uh, eschatological position. It's exciting. My position isn't exciting. My position says, hey, look, most of these things already took place. Uh, uh, there's no indication. Uh, actually, if you're a dispensationalist, if, if there anybody's listening to this as a dispensationalist who believes in a pre-tribulational rapture and that the rapture is an imminent, any-moment event, nothing that's taking place today has any relevance to a pre-tribulational rapture. Exactly. Uh, because the, if, if, the, if the rapture is an any-moment event and could take place at any moment, that means it could have taken place 10 years ago, could have taken place 20 years ago, could have been taken, taken place 50 years ago, could have taken place before Israel became a nation again in 1948. It could have taken place before the Balfour Declaration was, was, was written. It could have been taken play, place any time from the time of, of, of Pentecost to today uh, because there are, supposed, there are no signs that will tell you that the rapture is, right, is, is near. Mm -hmm. And yet these guys couldn't sell prophecy books with that with that view so they, well, they, quite, yeah. they yeah they've sensationalized the whole rapture idea with this these signs I, in fact there are two uh, I just got two books in the mail I wrote a wrote an article about it that these uh, one book by uh, David Jeremiah and it's a whole book about you know signs leading up to the to, to the rapture uh, the, the, pr the problem with that particular book is is that uh, he even states in there, that the rapture is a signless event, and yet the whole book is about signs. Uh, and so there's a great deal of, of ignorance and schizophrenia uh, among a lot of these prophecy writers. Yes, indeed. And uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's actually an industry, really. When you consider, you know, some of the sales of those books, I mean, you know, the, the late great planet Earth, um, you know, Hal Lindsey, I mean, 
it, it just seems to get ignored the fact that it was an abject failure in its uh, pr prophetic predictions. And but yet, you know, there's just it's just book after book, TV series, all sorts of stuff go on here. So there, you know, there, there's a lot of people motivated to keep this uh, lie, which is what it is, going. I believe, you know. Yeah. In fact, these I wrote a couple of articles at um, to uh, AmericanVision.org about pro prophetic speculation based upon a couple of books, one David Jeremiah's book, and the other one is Ron Rhodes' book called, I think, Jesus in the End Times or Jesus in the Last Days. And uh, the, all these books do is repeat what people have been saying for decades. And it's, they make the same exegetical mistakes. Uh, I mean, Ron Rhodes' book, uh, he, he doesn't deal with the time texts uh, he, he fudges on the time text. He says, you know, soon or quickly means that when, when Jesus decides to come, it'll be fast. Uh, that's not at all what the word means, and there's no logic behind it either. And the only place he, find, he, he can find that supports his position is the, the woman and the unrighteous judge in Luke chapter 18, and where it says that uh, she was given justice speedily. Well, that doesn't mean, well, when he decided to give her justice, it would be fast. It meant that he was giving her justice in, in due time it, before she died. Exactly. So, yeah, but now the words, you know, soon and, and um, quickly mean, oh, when Jesus comes, and that could be 2,000 years from now, it, it will be fast. Well, of course it'll be fast. <laughs> I mean, no, no one's thinking it's going to be slow. <laughs> uh, but, there, but, but there's, you know, Revelation 1.1 1, 1, uh, just talks about that, uh, the, 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 his, it talks about his soon coming, and verse 3 says, because the time is near. And what's interesting is that Ron Rhodes never deals with that word near, which means, in fact, near. And I, I've looked at every instance of, the, the, of each Greek word, one translated soon or quickly, and the other one near or at hand, and they always mean something that's close at hand and something that's going to happen within a short period of time. Um, so it's it, it's just amazing. But people, the sensationalism, these people just, they eat it up. And it, it, it makes their, their life in this world more convenient. Indeed. And, you know, maybe we can explain to, to the listeners what a preterist is. Um, I mean, I came across, I came across you, I think it was 2013. Um, I'd read Matthew 24. And I, I really couldn't understand where where the idea that this was talking about the future. It seemed so obvious to me that this was, you know, talking about an imminent event. And so I went looking for people who, who maybe, you know, because it, it was hard to find people um, who shared my view. Um, you know, because the, the dispensationalist view is so popular. I find yourself and I find Steve Gregg. And I mean, I even think and I know it's probably so, you know, I, 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 some people think it's a dangerous way to think. But I, I even think you you could make an argument to go full preterist based on this, the, the, the exegesis for becoming a partial preterist. Um, but I know that seems to be really, really heretical. But what you can say is that every Christian from the inception of the church has led their lives and died without Jesus coming back. So why is it so important anyway, you know? Well, yeah, they, in fact, if you go back to the early church, you'll, you'll see emphatically that they did not believe in something called a pre-tribulational rapture. In fact, there's a new book out um, by, let's see, uh, Michael Brown, and who's the other author? Um, I, can't, I can't recall his name. But they, they take a, a post-tribulation view. They believe that we're going to go through this thing called the Great Tribulation. It's actually a pretty good book because it talks about how they left the pre-tribulational rapture view and became post-tribulational. Uh, it's a weak book because it really doesn't deal with preterist arguments, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to the, the definition of that. It doesn't deal with preterist arguments, although embedded in a number of places in their book, uh, they, they do reference a preterist argument. And a preterist, if anybody's taken... Uh, Latin or uh, one of the Latinized languages, there's the preterist tense. In Greek, it's the aorist tense, which is a, a, a past tense, which, which simply means that when a particular prophecy is given and that prophecy has been fulfilled, 
that prophecy is is uh, the fulfillment is in the past. Therefore, it's a a it's in a preterist mood in terms of its fulfillment. So it simply means it's past. It it was in fact a prophecy. That prophecy was fulfilled. Uh, therefore, it's it's a preterist. A, a so someone who believes that is a preterist. Anybody who's a Christian and looks at all the prophecies that you'll find in the Old Testament related to the first coming of Jesus, and if you, and of course you have to believe that they've been fulfilled, if you, or you're not a Christian, doesn't make any sense, you are in fact a preterist. Yeah. Uh, and so when Jesus said, you know, on the third day he's going to be raised up again, and that happened, therefore you're a preterist on that particular prophecy. Well, there are other prophecies in the New Testament, uh, the Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, which is called, each of those is called the Olivet Discourse because Jesus was on, on the Mount of Olives when he gave this particular prophecy. I've, I've dealt with the Matthew version of it. And, uh, you know, they, in, in Matthew, actually, if you, in order to get Matthew's version uh, right, what you have to do is go all the way back to Matthew chapter 21. <laughs> Because that's Jesus is, ascends to the Mount of Olives. And so Matthew 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives. And, and throughout, you know this is a second person plural. Jesus uses you, 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 you. And the, uh, and the, the anti, anti-Christ uh, Jewish people at that particular time, when Jesus was talking about their demise, He's, and he's, they say, well, Jesus is talking about us. He's not talking about some future group of people. He's talking about that particular generation. Because uh, John says, you know, Jesus came unto his own, but his own, you know, believed him not. Now, it doesn't mean that all of the Jews dis- disbelieved Jesus. That's not the case at all. Yeah, it's uh, a remnant. But, so, yeah. yeah, there was a, basically the leadership did. They're the ones that took him to the various uh, the, the ecclesiastical court and the civil court and the Herod. And they lied in front of Herod to make him a political rabble rouser and all that. And so, and in fact, at the cross, you got Matthew in the John chapter 19, verse 15. When given the chance to choose Barabbas or Jesus, they choose Barabbas over Jesus. And then Jesus says, shall I crucify your king? And they shout out, we have no king but Caesar. I mean, I mean, there it is, there it is right there. That's, that's why that particular generation and that generation alone was judged. No, no future generation is going to be judged like Israel was judged because only that generation could reject Jesus as the promised Messiah. That's what Acts chapter 2 is all about. So Matthew chapter 24 is about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 because in Matthew 23, Jesus says, your house is being left to you desolate. He leaves the temple and then in Matthew, the opening of Matthew chapter 24, the disciples asked, when are, the, when are these things going to happen? Uh, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And, uh, of course, Jesus had just pointed out to the temple, the temple to them and said, look, not one stone here is going to be left upon another. They're all going to be destroyed. And then they asked that three-part question. So Jesus gives, Jesus lays out the signs, tells, you know, there will be wars and rumors of wars, be famines in various places, be false pr- prophets, false Christ's great tribulation, uh, the abomination of desolation. It goes on and on and on. And he finishes that section with, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. But every time in the Gospels, when Jesus uses the phrase, this generation, it always means, without exception, the generation to whom Jesus was speaking. And people say, well, how can you say that because he says sun, moon, and stars are going to fall and all that kind of thing? Well, Jesus there is quoting directly from the Old Testament. And when the sun goes dark and the moon goes dark and stars fall, it's a sign of the, the end of a nation, the judgment on a nation. You can find that in Isaiah chapter uh, 13, which is a description of Babylon. Yeah, that's apocalyptic kind of uh, yeah, that, language. It, isn't it, it? Is so, it is so typical of the Old Testament. And I use the New American Standard version, but I'm always checking it with the Greek. And the New American Standard has every all these Old Testament quotations in small caps. And so Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. And even the, the, the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds of heaven, mm-hmm. uh, that, that's a direct quotation from uh, uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. If you go back and look at that, yeah. Jesus is going up to the Ancient of Days. 
Yeah, yeah that's, that's why they. Yeah, yeah, that's why the um, um, Caiaphas, when he, when Jesus said, "You shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds," he was quoting Daniel, and he ripped off his his uh, yeah. garment as Blas- for blasphemy. Yeah, yeah. So the, that's the preterist interpretation. Matthew twenty four, the, the Olivet Discourse is dealing specifically with that generation and that generation alone. That's why. That's what the word this, the near demonstrative, this means. It means something that's close by. If Jesus had a future generation, he would have said, that generation will not pass away. Uh, Yeah, so so now we're in a situation where we have, you know, fast forward 2,000 years later, uh, we have Christians sending money over to Israel and the rabbis so they can build their temple. I mean, this would be in a rebellion against Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus, (laughs) Jesus says your house is being left to you desolate. He ends up destroying it through, uh, through the agency of, of the Roman government. Uh, so, uh, because he is he is the temple, he is yeah. the sacrifice, he is the priest, and all of a sudden we've got Christians who are saying, no, no, we need to. Re- the Jews need to rebuild another temple. Well, if the Jews rebuild the temple, it only shows their disbelief. Uh, exactly. and- Opinions expressed on this radio okay, station, its programs, ads, and its website by the hosts, Skype, guests, but, and common um, listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the guy. original source yes, who expressed them. They do not yeah, necessarily uh, represent uh, the opinions uh, of Revolution issue, Radio and Freedom Slips.com, its staff, um, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution well, Radio, Freedom Slips.com, 100% the Philippines, or Egypt, or Syria, or Somalia, you would know all about tribulation. And we have this attack on the Muslim attack, as it is, and we condemn that obviously and you know and the, and the mainstream media is all over it they're not talking about a, a constant genocide that's going on in, in, in those reasons that i just mentioned over the last sort of i don't know five ten years yeah i know I, I, what's it's it's interesting is that on facebook uh we're seeing this uh over and over again uh, where people are posting say hey why aren't you di- discussing this why aren't you discussing that look at Look what's happening in Nigeria. Look what, what's happening in France. What, look what's happening all over the world, and you're not saying anything about it. Here in the United States, uh, of course, we had, we had 9-11, which I mean, it's amazing how quickly we forget, but we had the Fort, Fort Hood shooting. There was this uh, one out in California uh, that the, you know, Muslims were involved in that. Uh, so it, it's, it's just unnerving for uh, for these for these people to continue to you know to say stuff like this and to build this up again, the tragic thing we none of us should be involved in uh, these kinds of actions against uh, against Muslims. Uh, it's uh, there's nothing in the Bible that would, would would support anything like that. We're 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 about evangelism and bringing people to Christ, and and, th- and that's another side of all this. When when a Muslim actually leaves Islam and becomes a Christian. They now become a target, uh, you know, for, you know, from from the Muslim community in many cases. Uh, some of them have lost their lives because of of their, uh, you know, change in faith. Uh, so it, there's a terrific uh, double standard. And I was this I was mentioning this book uh, by Michael Brown and Craig Keener that I I just got yesterday, uh, and it's called Not Afraid of the Antichrist. And it's see why we don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. And they have a chapter in there on uh, this idea of tribulation. You know, how, these people who believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, uh, they they deal with some of the history of what's recent history of what's take, taking place around the world among among Christian groups. So it's it has some good points in it, uh, but it does not really deal with the you know, preterist arguments, and I understand why, because it's very d- difficult for any futurist, pre- pre-tribber, mid-tribber, post-tribber, or uh, post-rapture, uh, pre-wrath rapture, all, all five of the rapture positions, very, very difficult to deal with the uh, uh, the preterist position. Yeah, um, but it is a, it is a, a staggering uh, double standard that uh, all you know the amount of Christians that have been uh, you know slaughtered at the hands of uh, ISIS maniacs and um, they're very selective about uh, what um, tragedies they focus on. You know. Yeah, well, it's typical of it doesn't fit their narrative. You know, they've established a narrative. This is what we're going to do, and anything that doesn't go along with that particular narrative, they just ignore. Uh, and that's something we're just, I guess, having to live with. Uh, but fortunately, we do have alter- alternate media 
Uh, but even that's uh, being taken away. I know that the Christchurch massacre, the, there was, a, I guess, a, the, the, the first person video of the guy doing the, doing the kill, killing was, was, was put up. And uh, the, the various media outlets have tried to you know, get it off the air so no one could see it. And I'm thinking, why are you doing that? Uh, you know, let let people see the, the 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 cruelty and the hatred of a of a guy like this. Keep his manifesto up. Uh, let him read the manifesto to see where he's coming from ideologically. So they want to hide all of this so they can say, oh, he was a right wing white nationalist and so forth. White so supremacist. On. We a yeah. white supremacist, and yet his favorite country was was communist China. Uh, yeah. And uh, um, and and communist China, of course, is bulldozing churches um, and, you know, uh, persecuting Christians and so forth. So it, it's it's really maddening to see what the media are doing uh, with, with, with all this news that it's out there with everyone. Yeah, there was actually uh, a journalist over here who pointed out that, it could, you know, it could quite easily make an argument that he's, he's as much as a, as a far left extremist as a, as a far right uh, based on his own writings. And there was a commentator that he was talking to and immediately shut that down and said, no, no, he was being ironic. He was being ironic, said, I'm, I, you know, am I a communist? Well, he's sort of like, I'm paraphrasing, he said, maybe. And that was just shut down. The narrative is he's a right wing extremist. We've got a, a rising problem with right wing extremism. And in this country, they have brought in legislation. Amber Rudd, uh, when she was Home Secretary, brought in. You can be uh, jailed for up to 15 years. And this is how it was, this is how this was presented for watching jihadi videos. Uh, far right propaganda and watching bomb making videos. So you've got, you know, a very ambiguous far right propaganda sandwiched in between something very specific and a national security threat, watching jihadi videos and bomb making videos. And there, there has been a massive increase in the rhetoric about this uh, right wing extremism now and the shutting people down. And, you know, you could be lifted for terrorism uh, now for just having certain views about immigration or whatever, you know. Oh, I know. I, I know on a related, on a maybe I guess unrelated subject in one way, but related another way. I guess in Great Britain, some woman used the wrong gender pronoun, uh, and uh, she was, I guess, hauled off by the police uh, because of misgendering someone. I mean, it's absolutely insane. Now, you put all this together, and you can see why Christians buy into this end time. The speculative scenario because they say, well, this was all predicted. Yeah, you know, people forget in the 20th century, you had two world wars. You had the Korean War, which wasn't really a war. You had the Vietnam War, which really wasn't a war. Um, you can go back to the 19th century here in the United States. You had a civil war. Um, you've had we've had earthquakes and famines and uh, plagues and so forth around the world. Uh, and I have a a friend who uh, actually came to one of my conferences, well, he actually invited me to his conference in, in Missouri, and I did it on eschatology, and I was, was amazed at the great reception I got from it, but he's written a book called Why You've Been Duped into Believing That the World Is Getting Worse, and he has all these statistics showing that the, the world is actually, in many cases, getting better. It doesn't mean that things aren't bad in places, but we have to remember that the reason we're getting all this this bad news is because news today travels at the speed of light. Uh, we get it immediately and we're saturated with it. But you got to remember, we're dealing with a, a population, a world population of 7.5 billion people. And you can always find in various corners of the world some very terrible things. And I think also because how media uh, pounces on stories that people like this shooter in New Zealand, he knew this was going to be a media event, and he did it knowing it was going to be a media event. And as a result, the media actually manufactures interest in this among people, and the people then use the media in order to get their, their worldview across. 
Yeah, and they're stoking up. Uh, they're stoking up a, a race war. I mean, you know, it, it's very, very uh, irresponsible, and I think deliberate what they're doing because we've got far too many Muslims now in the West, and and then you get the media stoking it up about this far right extremism. I mean, after that attack in New Zealand, you then had an attack uh, with a Turkish guy t- killed three people in Holland on, on a tram. Uh, we've recently, yesterday, uh, last night, uh, there was va- uh, vandalism done on five mosques. I grew up in Northern Ireland. You know, this type of stuff is kind of akin to what was going on in Northern Ireland. It was just a Protestant attack, and then a Catholic attack. It was tit for tat, tit for tat, and it went on and on, except this is going to be an even uh, just a bigger nightmare if it continues, you know? Yeah, I think the Mus- the Islamic extremists, you know, they, they kind of hold off. They, they, they gather their, their powder, keep it dry, and then they decide... We're going to go, we're going to, we'll, we'll retaliate in, in, in some way or another. Um, and uh, it, it, you're right, it never does, in fact, stop. That's why the Bible is against dueling, because they know once you start, you know, dueling, it never ends because you kill one family member, then the next family member comes along and he, he wants retribution. And then, then the other family member gets killed on the other side and it gets going back and forth. We had this in the United States, the Hatfields and the McCoys. You know, two big families that continue to feud for decades. And, uh, you know, Christians should be all about peace and promoting peace. Uh, unfortunately, there's there are those in the Muslim community who don't want peace. They really don't want peace. Uh, they, they, they want their caliphate all around the world. We've got a couple of uh, bizarre uh, uh, Islamic extremists in our own Congress who were in, uh, elected in congressional districts where there has been a, a, an influx of, uh, of Islamic people from around the world, and they put these people in, and they are they're, they're extremists to the nth degree. And I don't know what's going to happen in the 2020 election, but uh, they're infiltrating every, every area of life, and it's unfortunate that Christians sit back and they don't see this as a problem. Yeah, I mean, I think it also must be said that there is a problem with um, the Israeli lobby in, in Congress as well. I mean, the, the, the Congress dances to the to the tune of uh, Israel in many cases, you know. Well, what we need to do in the United States is to get rid of all of our um, foreign aid. Uh, exactly. Including to Israel. Uh, and I know, you know, you do that, and there are a lot of Christians who are upset about that. But there's nothing in the Bible that says we have to give money to any nation. And there's nothing in the Bible that says we have to give money to Israel. Now, if, if these people want to continue to give money to Israel, they're free to do so, but not with my money. And it's not, just, it's not because it's Israel. It's because they're giving away our money to other, other, to other nations. I mean, it's bad, enough, it's bad enough that they're giving money away to people in our own country who don't work for a living, uh, who, who, don't, who, who don't really own that money. There's, you know, there, there is the Eighth, eighth Commandment. Thou shalt not steal, and the and, and the tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet, and that applies to governments as well. And our government steals money from from hardworking people, and then gives it to other people who don't work. And I know there's always a sob story behind it all, but now we're giving it away, you know, billions of dollars to you know to countries over you know overseas, mm. um, and it's just you know we need to we need to bring our you know, many of our armed forces, you know, back home again as well. Yeah. We, need to, we need to get out of these wars that we're involved in. Um, so there's a lot that needs to be done. There's a good friend of mine, Dr. Gary North, says you can't change just one thing. There are all kinds of things that have to be changed and dealt with, and uh, that has to happen soon. Yeah, I mean, what is it, it, what is the scriptural argument for and against quickly for you know for Christians you know only kind of sort of worship in, in in private? I mean, the Lord's Prayer comes to mind. You know, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So surely that's a license for us to to flex our muscle in terms uh, politically and culturally as well to to you know seeing that come to pass as much as we can. You know, uh, even beyond the gospel, I think. Oh, yeah, we should be applying the Bible to every area of life. And, and if, uh, I always remind people, I said, look, you can't say that without coming back and saying that civil government should be limited. And so when we talk about Christians' involvement in politics, we don't want to use the Christian involvement in politics to force people to become Christians. We want, the, we want the civil government to do what the civil government ought to be dealing with, and that's a very limited area a very limited jurisdiction. 
Uh, but in, here in the United States, the, the jurisdiction of the civil government is unbelievably la uh, uh, vast. And then you've got state governments that, that do the same thing at the state level. And so Christian involvement in politics is to decrease the power of the state, not to increase it or not to just flip the people who are in charge with now putting Christians in charge of the budget but for Christians to be in charge of the budget to, in order to lower the budget, to cut spending, to get us out of certain areas, to get, to, you know, we have, we have national public radio. We don't need that. That's not a, it's not a function of government. We're giving a half a billion dollars to Planned Parenthood. That's not the business of government. A federal department of education that's, that uh, uh, has pilfered $60 billion from taxpayers uh, we, we sent men to the moon before there was a federal department of education. We don't need a federal department of education that spends $60 billion. Uh, and so Christian involvement isn't to take over the government. It's to limit the power of the state and to make and put it in its proper jurisdictional uh, limitations. Yeah. And, you know, when you look at things like, you know, the, the gay marriage and this transgender stuff, this is the type of stuff where I'm saying there's no there's no pushback on this, and you know from from Christianity, with any real lobbying power, because they're just setting ducks with it. And you know, only recently I read a story in a school where you know teachers were in, or parents were in trouble for, you know, objecting to some of the sex and quote education that the kids are being taught, and. You know, and it's just, it's it's come to the point of like you know the state just persecuting. There, there's no there's a lot of Christians or people who would call themselves Christians, but there's no representation or influence. You know. Yeah, we here in the United States we have, uh, and I guess you had it in Great Britain as well, where uh, you know a baker refused to make a cake for a, uh, a homosexual wedding. I think there was a, a another a sweet cakes by Melissa. She was fined a hundred and thirty five thousand dollars. Exactly. Because she because she refused to make a cake for a homosexual couple, and yet, if a homosexual baker uh, refused a Christian to say you know something about uh, I, you know, I believe in traditional marriage, and the and the homosexual owned bakery shop said no to it, nothing would happen to that person. No. Uh, and we there's there are signs up, and I mean there are people literally are people who have been run out of restaurants. Uh, because they were Trump supporters, refused service, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden the homosexual lobby, you know, wins in court over these ridiculous cases. People, freedom of association is, in fact, part of what it means to be, uh, you know, to be free. I, I should be free to associate and do business with whom I want. Uh, and if you don't like that, you can go somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. And um, you know, there's plenty of other stories like that. I mean, and and there was a. There was a church in Ireland because because Ireland's very anti-Christian at the minute. You know they've they voted in for uh, gay marriage and they've now you know repealed the original abortion laws. And there was a there was a church or a, sorry a hospital in Louth where they were attempting to change the name because obviously there's a massive Catholic influence there and it was uh, Our Lady something or other. And they were changing they were attempting to change the name um, because it's you know that it's not it's not reflective of the secular culture. Now thankfully there was some pushback on that, but you know it's 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 an obvious pattern, this kind of like destroying the Christian foundations. Yeah, and that's the thing. When you look at the uh, mercy ministries and hospitals and so forth, almost all of them were founded by you know religious organizations, uh, most most of them Christian. Uh, and and here, so they 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 continually steal. They go into our garden and steal all of our vegetables and claim them for themselves, and then try to make the claim that Christianity is the bad guy. And yet it was Christianity that gave gave us the university system, which is now corrupt, and and gave us the hospitals, which now do abortions, uh, which gave us the 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 essence of of what a civilized civil government should be like. And yet that's being turned on us. And forcing people to comply with uh, with with certain with certain laws that are contrary to everything related to the Christian religion. Indeed. All right. Well, we probably better wrap up, guys. You, you probably cover a lot of the, this type of stuff in God and Government, don't you? I do. I have. A, yes, I have. Uh, and anything on eschatology, I've done in my latest book, uh, 
of wars and rumors of wars. You can get any of those things at AmericanVision.org. Uh, I have a number of uh, video courses on there as well. Lots of books related to that particular topic. Uh, I write every day at uh, AmericanVision.org and GaryDemar.com. Uh, I I just put up an article, you know, today uh, dealing with uh, reparations here in the United States. Uh, people are pushing uh, reparations, uh, paying, you know, for because of slavery. And then I have another one up there, uh, the atheist dilemma regarding something called evil. How does an atheist explain evil in the world? How does atheists explain what happened in in New Zealand if there is no God? Basically, you know, stuff just happens, and that's the end of it. Yeah. All right, Guy. It was great to speak to you again, and uh, hopefully we can do it soon. Um, I appreciate you're busy, so I uh, All right. appreciate you coming on. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Um, I will be back next Thursday. If you want to support the work I do, you can do that on PayPal, Stevenson underscore P5 at Sky.com. But anyway, okay, I will be back uh, next Thursday then, so... I hope you enjoyed the show. It's always great to have Gary on. Until then, all right, bye-bye.